Good morning and welcome to WGN TV Political Report. I'm Paul Lisnick. It's a region on the brink of war. Russia moving over 150,000 troops to the border with Ukraine, but claiming it has no intention to attack or start a war. Russia says it's simply conducting military exercises. The United States and members of NATO in that region see it differently. The Biden administration warning that war is imminent and even going so far as to outline how Russia would initiate the conflict. NATO members hope there can be a way out. The U.S. is prepared to use diplomacy, if that's at all possible. Joining me this morning to talk about what's next are Elizabeth Shackelford. She's the senior fellow on U.S. foreign policy and Dina Smelt, senior fellow on public opinion and foreign policy, both from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Ladies, good morning. Thanks for being with me. Good to see you. Good morning. Uh, Dina, let me start with you with this question. I, you know, for viewers who aren't following this closely, let's just ask this question. How did we get here? I mean, I mean, right now we have Russia wanting to basically take over a democratic, democratically run country. Why there? Why now? So there's really um, the immediate standoff, yes, is between Russia and Ukraine. But there is also a wider aperture, which is between Russia the U.S. and NATO and relitigating, Russia trying to relitigate the post-Soviet European architecture. Um, the Russians, we have done surveys and, and uh, interviews with Russian officials, Russian experts, um, and they feel that the United States and the West took advantage of Russian weakness in the 90s and expanded NATO. And now um, it seems that Putin is using leverage or using the Ukraine Russia crisis as leverage to try to renegotiate some of those terms of European security and Russia's role and influence in Europe. Um, the Within Ukraine, it's really a continuation of the crisis from 2014, mm, yeah. when Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea, and also fomented uh, uh, rebel groups in eastern Ukraine. And that conflict has been going on really since then. Um, in April 2019, there was a new uh, Ukrainian president elected, Vladimir Zelensky, who is a Russian speaker and was a comedian turned president. And he set out to improve relations with Russia, actually, and started negotiations yeah. on a peace deal. Yeah, let, me, um, let me just step in there and, and just, we'll move this along. But uh, Elizabeth, let me just ask you, uh, as, uh, as she said, I mean, obviously there was the uh, attack into, you know, Georgia, Crimea. If he gets Ukraine, I mean, isn't there a fear if you live in a Baltic state, Moldova, Poland, Romania, aren't you next? Well, that's certainly the fear, and that's one of the big reasons that NATO is taking this so very seriously. I mean, I believe NATO and the U.S. have both um, said fairly publicly that they're not going to be going in to Ukraine specifically, but the concern is that if, if uh, Putin's allowed to go further into Ukraine than he, he already has, then what's to stop him from moving beyond that? If not in the next year, then maybe in the next five years or ten years. Um, but I think that you've got Putin looking at the situation in the West, and as of a few weeks ago, I think he expected that he might have found a NATO that was not really unified and pushing back against further Russian aggression towards Ukraine. But um, he's really gotten the opposite. I mean, NATO has really aligned together diplomatically um, with a very strong stance uh, for exactly those reasons. Yeah, I think everybody except Hungary, right? I mean, maybe Hungary may be the only one breaking away from that group. But Dina, let me ask you, look, we all know we can't trust what Putin says, right? No, we're not invading. We're not doing anything. Everything is fine. And we have the Biden administration, the president and other people like Tony Blinken, basically telling the UN and telling all of us, look out, here's what he's going to do. It'll be a false flag operation on and on and on. My question is, is that is that an actual likely reporting of intelligence as we know it? Or is that President Biden and his administration sort of trying to undercut Putin by saying, you see, you can't get away with anything. If you try any of this, we'll know. Well, we don't really know what the U.S. intelligence says since right. we're not working within the administration. But um, I think this is a way that but Biden and his administration and advisors have studied how Russians have worked in, in the past with some of the uh, examples you mentioned, like Georgia, and they're trying to meet his tactics with uh, similar ones, trying to beat him to the intelligence to show like if this is a false flag, if these are false provocations, to show that um, this isn't getting by the, the United States yeah. officials. Um, Elizabeth, obviously Russia has said during this past week, hey, we're removing troops. There were reports that they were, but then the U.S. stepped in and said, no, they're not. Uh, none of that is happening. So I'm sort of curious from your work, your study, uh, is Putin trying to gaslight? 
everybody. I mean, is this or is this a message he's trying to send Ukrainians? Like, hey, don't worry about it. We're not doing anything, and this is all just propaganda and a ruse. I mean, that would be my guess, and that's uh, very similar to the tactic that he played in Georgia back in 2008, claiming that they were pulling back at a time when they weren't. Um, at this stage, I, I think that Putin is largely playing to a domestic audience as well, trying to get support behind him and ensure that the Russian audience believes that he, you know, he is not the aggressor and that they're the victims here. Um, but it, it's also, you know, making that case for the public audience and the rest of the world, as long as he has some form of plausible den deniability. The problem is, I mean, as Dina said, we don't know what the U.S. intelligence is, but aerial photos are pretty clear that you you still have this very large uh, presence at the border and that it has not really been, um, if, if any kind of significant uh, withdrawal, it certainly hasn't been much. Of course, you ladies both have, like, your, your areas of expertise. Dean, I am going to come to you now because I know you have a specialty in reporting the average person's impressions, right, of post-war and conflict resolution. You do surveys and all that. You've already conducted a public opinion polls regarding the American support for U.S. decisions on how we should respond. And am I right if I'm, if I'm reading the results correctly that Americans basically believe there should be consequences for Russia, but we're not in the mood for any bloodshed? Um, to some extent, yes. Yeah. So Americans would prefer not to take a side if they are, are allowed to not take a side. But if things advance and if uh, we start to see images on television, yes, our poll found that 50 percent of Americans said they would favor using U.S. troops if Russia were to invade the rest of the Ukraine. It doesn't say exactly how to use those troops. And that's a bit higher than some of the previous polls I've seen, but now I've noticed that polls are edging up to about those same numbers. And when Americans are most likely to favor sending U.S. troops is when um, Russia invades all of Ukraine, not just sort of separatist republics. But if so, again, it depends how things are messaged and what the actual action is on the ground. And Elizabeth, let me sort of broaden this picture to sort of the Biden administration image and policy and all of that. Um, you have written that Biden promised to change U.S. foreign policy after this, you know, military driven approach we've had. The, the Trump administration's America first policy. Biden wants to change all that. Um, and he's actually committed to using military power only as a tool of last resort. You've written all of that. So talk about the Biden administration's position. What does it say to America, to the world about his image? How is the how is the world looking at the U.S. right now? Because according to many Republicans, they see us as weak. They see him as weak. I, I know that the response of the Biden administration isn't incredibly satisfying to a lot of people who would like to see really clear action. But I think it has fallen perfectly in line with what President Biden and his administration have said that they are going to do. They're leading with diplomacy. They're reserving the use of military force in the defense of core U.S. national security interests. At the same time, uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken have uh, communicated to the American people and to our allies in the West that um, that it is a very important interest to the United States, maybe not a core national security interest, but a strong interest to us nonetheless, that uh, we do not allow a country such as Russia to violate the sovereignty of Ukraine, uh, a democracy that's next door. So I think that the, the response has been to really invest time and effort in bringing the allies together, in um, communicating that there's going to be a very strong response, although probably prim primarily in terms of facilitating Ukraine's own self-defense and on the economic side. And I think it's really going to it's really going to communicate well uh, you know, what to the rest of the world what Biden's decisions are going to be in the future and other similar conflicts, what they actually do should Russia further and create further invade Ukraine. So, so Dina, I think he's really followed his pattern. So, Dina, as Elizabeth talks about sort of Biden's approach, what he's thinking about in terms of his image, as we know, this past Thursday during the week, Russia expelled the U.S. Embassy's number two American diplomat, Bart Gorman, um, which the U.S. says was unprovoked. So I'm sort of curious, as, as Biden tries to create this image, then Russia goes, by the way, that guy, he's out. What message does that kind of step take, uh, show, uh, illustrate? Um, that's probably more in Lizzie's wheelhouse. All right. Well, then, Lizzie, all yours. Yeah, it's it's once again playing the diplomatic games. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that uh, different sides can message. And I, I think that that is Putin probably suggesting that um, you know he's going he's gonna to play on the diplomatic front as well. I, this is a multifaceted um, competition here going on between Russia and the United States and the West largely. I wouldn't put much into it. I'm not surprised. In fact, I think there were reports over a week before he actually left that he had been notified that he was going to have to leave. So um, this doesn't seem like a dramatic escalation so much as just a continuing tit for tat. And yeah, there's just a lot of signaling going back and forth between letters and um, letters and expulsions and closing embassies or consulates. So 
it's just part of a, a bigger game. Yeah, I was going to say, it's all, it's all part of a larger game. Let me just sort of wrap with your each of you sort of responding to this, which is, you know, the U.S., NATO countries, they're all saying there's a road to diplomacy here. We want to find a way. Supposedly, Blinken will meet with Lavrov uh, this next week for efforts as long as there's no attack, says, uh, says Blinken. So, Dina, let me start with you. Um, do you think Putin is after something diplomatically, or is this all a game and ultimately there's no stopping an attack? It's hard to say, but I do think that there is a diplomatic route to be taken. Um, some people, such as Michael McFall, who used to be uh, our U.S. ambassador to Russia, thinks that there should be a rethink, uh, a comprehensive rethink of European security and to have a Russian role in it. But at, at the very least, um, there's definitely a place for arms control negotiations yeah. to return to some of those that we had before with Russia, and also more transparency around the deployment of troops and of um, arms in the region so that both sides know what the other side is doing to prevent a miscalculation. All right. Uh, we just ran out of time, but uh, Dina, Elizabeth, Lizzie, thank you so much for your time. Good to see you guys again. Thanks for your insight. We'll see what happens. We'll be watching. We'll monitor you. with you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And we're going to take our first break. Still to come on WGN TV Political Report. As much of Illinois prepares to go maskless next week, well, the CDC, they're sticking with its guidance for now. We're talking to White House advisor Dr. Cameron Webb about the next phase of this pandemic. But first, a new battlefield in the fight over a new Chicago ward map, how an unlucky partnership could send the decision into the hands of voters. That's when we come back.